direction one. If you would avoid uncleanness, avoid the things that dispose you to it, as gluttony, your fullness of diet, and pampering the flesh, idleness, and other things mentioned under the next title of subduing lust. The abating of the filthy desires is the surest way to prevent the filthy act, which may be done if you are but willing. Direction 2. Avoid the present temptations. Go not where the snare lies without necessity. Abhor the devil's bellows that blow up the fire of lust, such as enticing apparel, filthy talk and sights, of which more also under the next title. Direction 3. Carefully avoid all opportunity of sinning. Come not near the door of her house, saith Solomon, Proverbs 10.8. Avoid the company of the person you are in danger of. Come not where she is, and this you can do if you are willing. None will force you. If you will go and seek for a thief, no wonder if you are robbed. If you will go seek fire to put in the thatch, no wonder if your house is burnt. The devil will sufficiently play the tempter. You don't need to help him. That is his part. Leave it to himself. It is your part to watch against him, and he will find you work. If you watch as narrowly and constantly as you can, it is well if you escape. As you love your soul, avoid all opportunities of sinning. Make it impossible to yourself. Much of your safety lies in this point. Never be in secret company with her you are in danger of, but either not at all or only in the sight of others. Especially contrive not such opportunities as to be together in the night, in the dark, or on the Lord's Day when others are at church. One of the devil's seasons for such works or any such opportunity, leisure, and secrecy, for opportunity itself is a strong temptation. And it is the way to make a thief to set money in his way, or so to trust him as that he can easily deceive or rob you and never be discovered. So it is a way to make yourself unclean, to get such an opportunity of sinning, that you may easily do it without any probability of impediment or discovery from men. The chief point in all the art or watch is to keep far enough off. If you touch the pitch, you will be defiled. Whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. Proverbs 6. 29. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife. Verse 27 and 28. Don't bring the fire and the gunpowder too near. If you cannot keep at a distance, nor forbear the presence of the bait, you are not like to forbear the sin. Direction 4. Reverence your own conscience. Mark what it speaks now, for it will shortly speak it in a more terrible manner. Hear it voluntarily, for it is terrible to hear it when you cannot resist. Treat with conscience in the way while it is reconcilable, for you know not how terrible a tormentor it is. I don't, don't doubt, but it has given you some gripes for your very loss before it ever came to practice, but the sorest of its gripes now are but like the playing of the cat with the mouse before the killing gripe is given. Does no man see you? Conscience sees you. And you are a wretch indeed if you reverence not conscience more than man." As Chrysostom saith, suppose no man know the crime but himself and the woman with whom he did commit it. How will he bear the rebukes of conscience when he carries about with him so sharp and bitter an accuser? For no man can overrun himself, and no man can avoid the sentence of this court within him. It is a tribunal not to be corrupted with money nor perverted by flattery, for it is divine being placed in the soul by God himself. The less the adulterer now feels it, the more he hastens to the perdition of a soul. Do you not feel a sentence passed within you, a terrible sentence telling you of the wrath of a revenging God? Bless God that it is not yet an irreversible sentence, but sue out your pardon quickly, lest it come to be that. Do you not feel that you are afraid and ashamed to pray or to address yourself to God, much more afraid to think of dying and appearing before Him? If your sin make you ready to fly from Him now, if you knew how... Can you now look him in the face at last, or can you hope to stand with comfort at his bar? Are you fit to live in heaven with him, that makes yourself unfit to pray to him? Even lawful procreation, as I said before, does blush to come too near to holy exercises. Conscience is a better friend to you than you imagine when it would reclaim you from your sin, and will be a sharper enemy than you can imagine if you obey it not. 
Direction 5. Suppose you saw written upon the door of the house or chamber where you entered to sin, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge, Hebrew 13.4, and write that or such sentences upon the chamber door or at least upon your heart. Keep your eye upon the terrible threatenings of the dreadful God. Dare you sin when vengeance is at your back? Will not the thought of hell fire quench the fire of lust or restrain you from your presumptuous sin? Do you not say with Joseph, How shall I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Jo- Genesis thirty nine seven. As it is written of a chaste woman that being tempted by a fornicator wished him first at her request to hold his finger in the fire, and when he refused answered him, Why then should I burn in hell to satisfy you? So ask yourself, Can I more easily overcome the flames of hell than the flames of lust? Direction 6. Remember, man, that God stands by. If he were not there, you could not be there, for in him you live and move and are. He that made the eye must see, and he that made the light in darkness does see as well in the dark as in the light. If you imagine that he is absent or ignorant, you believe not that he is God, for an absent and ignorant God is no God. And dare you, I say, dare you commit such a villainy and God behold you? What, that which you would be ashamed to do if a child should see? Which you would do not if a mortal man stood by? Do you think that your locks or secrecy or darkness have darkened or shut out God? Do you not know that he sees not only within your curtains, but within your heart? Oh, what a hardened heart you have, that in the sight of God, your maker and judge, you dare to do such wickedness. Ask your conscience, man. Would I do this if I knew tomorrow I was going to die and go before God? Would I do this if I saw God, yea, or but an angel in the room? If not... Should you do it when God is as sure there as if you saw him? Or remember, man, that he is a holy God and hateth uncleanness, and that he is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12.29. Direction 7. Suppose all the while that you saw the devil opening the door and bringing you your mate and driving on the match and persuading you to the sin. But if he appeared to you openly to play his part, as sure as he now plays it unseen, would not your lust be cooled? Would not the devil cure the disease which he has excited in you? Why then do you obey him now when he is as certainly the instigator as if you saw him? Why, man, have you so little reason that seeing and not seeing will make so great a difference with you? What if you were blind? Would you play the fornicator before all the company because you don't see them when you know that they are there? If you know anything, you know God is there, and you may feel by the temptation that Satan is in it. Will you not be ruled by the laws unless you see the king? Will you not fear for the infection of the plague unless you see it? Use your reason for your soul as well as for your body, and do in the case as you would do if you saw the devil tempting you and Christ forbidding you. Direction 8. If thou be unmarried, marry. If these your remedies will not serve, it is better to marry than to burn. 1 Corinthians 7, 9. It is God's ordinance partly for the sinned. Marriage is honorable in the bed undefiled. Hebrews 13, 4. It is a resemblance of Christ's union with his church and is sanctified to believers. Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 7. Perhaps it may cast you upon great troubles in the world if you be unready for that state, as it is with apprentices. Forbear than your sin at ease your race, or else a lawful means must be used, though it undo you. It is better your body be undone than your soul, if you will needs have it to be one of them. But if you be married, already you are a monster and not a man, if the remedy prevail not with you. But yet the other directions may also be serviceable to you. Direction 9. If left's means prevail not, open your case to some able faithful friend and engage them to watch over you, and tell them when you are most endangered by the temptation. This will shame you for your sin and lay more engagements on you to forbear it. If you tell your friend, now I am tempted to the sin and now I am going to it, he will quickly stop you, break your secrecy, and you lose your opportunity. You can do this if you be willing. If ever your conscience prevails so far with you as to resolve against your sin, or to be willing to escape, then take the time all conscience is awake and go tell your friend. Tell him who it is that is your wicked companion, and let him know all the haunts that he may know the better how to help you. Do you say that this will shame you? 
it will do so to him that is it is known to, but that is a benefit of it, and that is the reason I advise you to it, that shame may help to save your soul. If you go on, the sin will both shame and damn you, and a greater shame than this is a gentle remedy in so foul and dangerous a disease. Direction 10. Therefore, if yet all this will not serve turn, tell it to many, yea, rather tell it to all the town that not be cured, and then the public shame will do much more. Confess it to your pastor, and desire him openly to beg the prayers of the congregation for the pardon and recovery. Begin thus to crave the fruit of church discipline yourself, so far you should be from flying from it, and spurning against it as the desperate hardened sinners do. If you say, This is a hard lesson, remember that suffering in hell is harder. Do not say that I wrong you by putting you upon scandal and open shame. It is you that put yourself upon it by making it necessary and refusing all easier remedy. I put you on it, but on supposition that you will not be more easily cured, almost as Christ puts you upon cutting off a right hand or plucking out a right eye, lest all the body be cast into hell. This is not the way that he commands you first to take. He would have you avoid the need of it, but he tells you that it is better to do the worse, and that this is an easy suffering in comparison of hell. And so I advise you, if you love your credit, forbear sin in a cheaper way, but if you will not do so, take this way rather than damn your soul. If the shame of all the town be upon you, and the boys should hoot after you in the streets, if it would drive you from your sin, how easy were the suffering in comparison of what it is like to be. Concealment is Satan's great advantage. It would be hard for you to sin thus if it were but open. 